So it's um, 10.30, so I'm going to uh, mute everybody and we'll start with our first piece of music, our hymn we can sing together, gathered here in the mystery of the hour. morning everyone. Welcome. We're so happy to be together in community. <clears throat> My name is Lauren Kennedy. My pronouns are she, her, and I am your service leader this morning. Before we begin, let us pause to remind ourselves that Edmonton or Meskis Waskahegan is a Cree name, meaning Beaver Hills House, and it's on Treaty 6 territory. It's the traditional home of diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, and many others. And we're part of that treaty and share responsibility for the stewardship of the land and to current and future generations. In the spirit of reconciliation and decolonization, we express our solidarity with Indigenous communities in their fight for self-determination and we recognize that we all have a role in learning about the past and present realities and doing our part. So some of us may be joining us today from farther away. And if so, I'm interested to know what traditional territory you're joining us from today. I invite you to put that into the chat. So once again, welcome to Westwood. In this final service of January, we once again focus on our fourth Unitarian Universalist guiding principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. As individuals and as a community, we come together to help each other explore what this means in our daily lives. And we're happy with you, that you're with us today. So I'm helped this morning by our terrific technician, Alara Stefanik Godet, our uh, you may have recognized Alara from their popular online Saturday afternoon story corner for youngsters, which you can find on Facebook. Just look up Westwood Unitarian. And I'm also pleased to be introducing our wonderful, wonderful speaker this morning, a little bit later on, Trudy Greinauer. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our musicians, Carrie Day and Rebecca Patterson for sharing their musical talents and for Bill Lee for editing our services and keeping our YouTube pages up to date. Thank you so much for your time and talent. And if we could have the chalice lighting. <clears throat> As a symbol of our connection and our shared purpose, we light this chalice together. and invite you to light your own candle at home. And for our chalice lighting words this morning, we will hear the reflection on the fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And this is by Reverend Paige Getty of the UU Congregation of Columbia, Maryland. As responsible religious seekers, we recognize that we're privileged to be free, to have resources to pursue life beyond mere survival, 
to continually search for truth and meaning, to exist beyond bonds of dogma and oppression, and to wrestle freely with truth and meaning as they evolve. <clears throat> this privilege calls us not to be isolated and self-centered, believing that our single perspective trumps all others, but rather to be humble, to be open to the great mysteries of truth and meaning that life offers. And those mysteries may speak to us through our own intuition and experience, but also through tradition, community, conflict, nature, and relationships. As a faith tradition, Unitarian Universalism makes sacred the right and responsibility to engage in this free and responsible quest as an act of religious devotion. Our candles of joy and concern are virtual spots of light that when we let each other know of either difficult times or moments of joy. And I invite you to share these with us in the chat. And because it's the last Sunday of the month, we also want to celebrate all those people who had birthdays in January. We have already seen Carl as one of them. Please add those names to the chat and join in singing with Rebecca.
Thank you, Rebecca. So if you'd like to join us in the affirmation, may the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Westwood is a self-supporting community and it's your contributions that sustain us. So we invite you to donate to Westwood by volunteering time, sharing your talent and donating financially if you can. E-transfers can be made to info at westwoodunitarian.ca and also see the information on the slide. So thank you for your continued generosity and support. Now let's sing along with Rebecca. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. So I feel fortunate to be able to introduce Trudy Greinauer. Trudy's been a friend of Westwood since 2008 and has generously helped as a caretaker of some of our essential online resources. She keeps us tidy and in order. She's a trained spiritual companion and a student of Soto Zen Buddhism. And she currently practices with Vancouver's Mountain Rain Zen community. So I look forward to her thoughtful reflections on what it means to undertake an in-depth search for truth and meaning. And I'm curious to hear what she will say today as she's offering to lead us into discomfort. Trudy. Thank you, Lorian. <clears throat> Good morning, all. And thank you for letting me share some thoughts this morning. What I mean with discomfort in the title are rough places we can get into on a spiritual journey. The image I chose is a rough and long stairway that I found quite arduous to climb. It is on Mount Hiei near Kyoto, a very important place in the history of Japanese Buddhism. I was there three years ago, half tourist and half pilgrim. And I'll also get to the companions who help us with the rough places. So on the left are two famous spiritual friends gazing at Mount Fuji. When Heather McLean Smith invited me to speak about the fourth principle, free and responsible search for truth and meaning, I looked it up on the UA website and found the reading from Reverend Getty that Lorian spoke at the beginning of our service. I got hooked on two words that I wasn't expecting in this context, but that resonated with my own experience in my spiritual search, to be humble and devotion. In her text, it says, this privilege calls us to be humble, to be open to the great mysteries of truth and meaning. And Unitarian Universalism makes sacred the right and responsibility to engage in this free and responsible quest as an act of religious devotion. And what got this talk going, what really interests me when looking at the fourth principle is the question, what does it mean to be responsible? Responsible to whom? Responsible to do what? Just to get this out of the way up front, I am a non-theist. In my view, spiritual responsibility has nothing to do with a God who will exercise some kind of judgment over my life journey while it lasts or after it is over. That's not it. In the quote, Reverend Getty starts with the recognition of our privilege. We live in democracy. We have freedom of speech. We are not oppressed by any kind of thought control or inherited dogma. And we have the space in our life and resources that make it possible for us to be on a spiritual path. We also have a supportive and stable community right here. 
So yes, this privilege of our situation compared to people in other circumstances, places or former times is a very good reason for not taking the spiritual search lightly, for taking responsibility. However, I think responsibility goes much deeper. Buddhists are very fond of pointing out that life is short and birth in human form very precious. A famous Zen verse reminds us that time swiftly passes by and opportunity is lost and ends with the admonition to take heed, do not squander your life. There is not unlimited time for our free search. A sense of responsibility should come out of the awareness of our mortality. And again, I think responsibility goes even deeper than that. For me as a Buddhist, the search for truth and meaning is the search for deep insight into myself and how things are, how the world is. And the point of that is to be able to act from that insight, to practice what is beneficial, stop and prevent what is harmful, and care about and benefit all beings. This is the triple vow, the deep aspiration of the Buddha way, to practice what is beneficial, stop and prevent what is harmful, and care about and benefit all beings. The more I know myself, the more I can let go of what is not serving this vow and encourage and foster in myself that which is. In this way, I feel I have a twofold responsibility to myself by following my highest aspirations for my path and to others by living ethically. My free search must be guided by and be in service to wisdom, compassion, and ethical behavior. This is what my pondering of the word responsible in the fourth principle led to, a responsibility to my spiritual aspirations and to an ethical life for the benefit of others. Since we are in a Unitarian service, I encourage you to consider this word for yourself and find your own answer. And I want to take you one step further. On a sunny day when everything goes our way, responsibility feels great and makes us feel important. We are on a spiritual search. Oh yeah, look at us go. But if we happen to enter rough terrain, that responsibility suddenly gains a lot of weight and becomes a burden. It can feel like schlepping a big backpack up those stairs on Mount Hie. How do we stay true to our responsibility then? Any spiritual quest gets hard at some point. I've never met an authentic teacher of any tradition who said otherwise. If someone wants to sell you online workshops for guaranteed enlightenment, don't waste your money. If the search for truth and meaning is also a search for deep insight into yourself, that's hard, right? Yes, it is. Gaining insight about ourselves on a deep level is hard, humbling, and often very uncomfortable. It's humbling and hard because we have to recognize and be honest about all the facades we put up all the distracting sideshows and stories we tell ourselves and then pull all that away. It's humbling because the more insight we gain, the more we see that we don't see very far. It's hard because it slowly dawns on us that this search and exploration will last a lifetime. Poet and feminist Adrienne Rich said, until we know the assumptions in which we are drenched, we cannot know ourselves. Until we know the assumptions in which we are drenched, we cannot know ourselves. And to assumptions, I would add these, our psychological shadow side and the baggage we inherited from our family and society, 
and any worldviews that make us take a privilege for granted. Until, the, until we know the hidden and unspoken things in which we are drenched, we cannot know ourselves. And uncovering and knowing all that can be very, very uncomfortable. So this is where devotion comes in. The word devotion comes from the Latin word for making a vow, vo vere. Reverend Getty calls our spiritual quest an act of religious devotion. Aware of our responsibility, we can make a vow to go deeper into the discomfort. We can be so devoted to this free, responsible search that we don't turn away from the rough places, but willingly enter them and work through them. Whew, this all sounds pretty heroic, doesn't it? Maybe this is just for people who have a special religious calling. Not so. The good news is, if we choose to devote ourselves to the search, help is available all around us. There are ministers, elders, and spiritual teachers. There are authors who give us inspiring books, speakers who record lectures and podcasts, and poets who accompany us with wonderful poems. There are peer groups and chalice circles and spiritual friends and spiritual companions. In the last six years or so, I have found great value in working with a spiritual companion and a Zen Buddhist teacher. So I want to elaborate a bit on these two roles. Spiritual accompaniment is sometimes called spiritual direction, although it has very little to do with being directed. It is practiced in many spiritual traditions, including Unitarian, both formally and informally. The companion is a compassionate listener and witness for my unique journey. By having someone listen to me deeply and reflecting back without judgment, I can listen to myself and hear my own truths. The companion doesn't instruct or prescribe, but holds space for me, creates a sanctuary for my story. I can bring to this space whatever I choose. There is no agenda. I was so touched and transformed by this experience that I trained for two years to offer this service. I'm so honored to now serve as a companion to others. The role of a Zen teacher is slightly different. Since the time of the Buddha, his teaching has been passed on from warm hand to warm hand for two and a half thousand years. The teacher helps me to explore and clarify the teaching and tradition and to work through ethical questions. My teacher also encourages me to stick to the discipline of Buddhist practice. Most of all, teachers set an example with their own practice and life. Just by being together in the practice, ceremonies, board meetings, meal preparation, teaching happens with or without words. <clears throat> Both roles have a lot in common. Both are witnesses in the moment and over time. Both are guides who are familiar with the terrain and willing to share their own practice as an example. But neither the companion nor the teacher is going to save me or do the work for me. The responsibility for my journey, my choices remains with me. And if you meet any teacher or guide who claims they will solve your problems, I suggest you run away as fast as you can. When working with either a teacher or a companion, the student needs to discern whether this person is authentic, trustworthy, and walks the talk. It will take some time to explore the question, is this the teacher or guide for me? This is a question not just of the intellect, but of the heart 
and gut as well. Once the relationship is established, it will therefore be based on considered, thoughtful trust. And then, sooner or later, the student will bump into one of those uncomfortable places. Only with trust will I be able to hear when a teacher points out a blind spot or a place where I am stuck. Only with trust will I follow a companion's encouragement to gently turn toward a difficulty instead of some habitual reaction of fighting it, running away, ignoring it, or trying to fix it. Once I trust a teacher or companion, I am even willing to say, yes, you may lead me into discomfort by questioning me, challenging me, nudging and poking me, you may lead me to where I don't want to go alone. Because I know you will not abandon me there. I know you will be by my side while I struggle with it. You will not try to solve or fix it for me, but your presence will reassure me. I don't have time today to speak in detail about the places of discomfort I have explored with my guides. They cover both the inner journey of self-awareness and the outer journey of ethical behavior. I've stood in the discomfort of self-doubt, fear and anger. I've struggled with difficult relationships and conflict and questions of belonging. I've encountered the discomfort of learning about white privilege and inadvertent microaggressions. I've sat with despair about the state of the world and not knowing what to do next. Maybe some of these places sound familiar to you. We all have our own places of discomfort that ask for our attention. Maybe you've entered some of yours willingly. Maybe you've just glanced at them in passing. What I want to leave you with today is the encouragement to recognize them, turn towards them, and find the support you need to do so. Talk to your minister, find a spiritual friend or companion, invite others, and start a talking circle. The places of discomfort hold the potential for growth and transformation. The places of discomfort hold the potential for growth and transformation. In our free and devoted search, it is our responsibility to meet them. May your path go well and hold many blessings. Thank you, Trudy. You actually make discomfort seem a little bit attractive. <laughs> Thank you. I've put Trudy's website, Zen Walks, uh, in the chat. If you want to see it there. And our closing song now, which you can sing along while you remain muted, Carrie Day. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with loving
For our closing words, we have words by Yehuda Amichai. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. And for this week, we're extinguishing our candle. Thank you for joining us this week. Next Sunday, I remind you that February 6th is the National Sharing Our Faith Sunday by the Canadian Unitarian Council. So the service is coming to us um, across the country at 11 o'clock our time, and you will need a specific link for that service. So you can find that on our webpage and it will come out in the email as well. It's important on this Sunday for our contributions to sharing our faith uh, to be made. That fund goes to congregations across Canada and helps us to reach out in many different ways. We have benefited several times from this fund and we will be applying for a grant again this year. So it's extra important that we make our contributions. So please visit our website and see other ways to connect and learn about other events that are happening in this special weekend. <laughs>